<laughs> Welcome to the programming primer. I presume you're here because you want to learn how to program a computer. <laughs> Let me tell you why that's a very good idea. <laughs> computer programs, software, it's everywhere. Of course it's in your laptop computer or your desktop computer or your phone or your tablet. But it's also everywhere else. It surrounds you. I mean, it's in this intercom. It's in this dumb light switch. It's in the coffee maker, the toaster oven, the range, the oven, the microwave oven, the refrigerator, my thermostats, the washing machine and dryer, my security system, my window shades. Television remote controls. That big fat television over there. And all the devices underneath it. That motion controller. That smoke alarm. My furnaces. The humidistat. The humidifiers. This whatever it is. My Bluetooth speaker. This microphone that I use has software in it. My electronic drums. That whiteboard has software in it. The camera that you're looking through. That printer. My key fobs. And there's a ton of software in these cars. I mean, there's software inside the engines that monitors the engines. And if you think about the entertainment centers in here and the GPS systems in here, there's just gobs of software for that. But there's more. These cars all have little, little sensors in them. Uh, these are ultrasonic sensors that can sense when other things are nearby. And down over here, there's a front-looking radar and a camera that looks at the road, and it can see lane markings. This, code, this car knows where it is in the highway lane system, and it can warn you. It can tell you if you're drifting over a lane. It'll tug on the steering wheel. There's software in there that tugs on the steering wheel. There's software all through this stuff. My point is that software is everywhere and it completely dominates our lives. I mean, think about it. You probably interact with software in one form or another every second of your waking life. And some of us even have software that monitors our sleep. And with all that software surrounding us, we've barely scratched the surface. Think about what might have software in it 10 years from now. Every light switch, every wall outlet, every light bulb, every door lock, every pen or pencil. How about your pair of glasses or a stapler or a carving knife? What about the hot water dispenser? What about all the faucets and the toilets and the shower, the bed, the table lamps? All that stuff could have software in it. And we haven't even begun to talk about household robots. If this car can detect its lane position and tug on the steering wheel to warn you if you're crossing the lane, how long before it actually just drives itself? And think about it. What if you could tell your car to drive to the store to pick up the groceries that you ordered online while you stayed home working in your home office writing software for your employer? I think you get the picture. There's a lot of software already out there and it all needs to be maintained and improved. And then there's a lot more software that needs to be written. We don't have nearly enough people to do it. 
Over the last half century, the number of programmers in the world has doubled every five years or so. Today, there are tens of millions of programmers, and it's not enough. I believe that the number of programmers in the world will continue to double every five years for several more decades. In fact, I think it's pretty reasonable to believe that computer programming could become both the most popular and the most populous career. So this is a good time to be interested in programming because if you know how to program and you can do it well, then you're going to have a rewarding, challenging, high-paying career. But it's not really about the money or the career. Oh, believe me, that helps. <laughs> but programming is about something else. Programming is about passion. <laughs> You've got to love it. You really can't do this kind of work unless you enjoy the hell out. Here's a dirty little secret about programmers. If they didn't pay us to write the code, we pay to write the code. Shh, don't tell anybody that's a secret, but there's a lot of truth in it. A good programmer loves to program. Do you love to program? That's what you're going to find out as you follow along with this course. What we do in this course is going to uh, challenge you, and it will puzzle you, and it will frustrate you until you are pounding your fists against the side of your head. You will believe that you have never done anything this difficult. You'll be enraged that the simplest things seem so hard. And yet, if you stick with it, you just might find that you love it like I do, and that like me, you want to do it for the rest of your life. So what is a computer? Well, nowadays, uh, if you ask that question, people would answer it by pointing at their laptop or, or their smartphone or their iPad or maybe their Apple Watch or something like that. And, and while it's true that all of those things are computers, there's a much simpler answer. Let me show you. This little switch and that overhead light and the wiring inside the walls here form the elements of a very simple computer. Uh, you might not think of a light switch as a computer, but it is one, and I'll prove it to you. First of all, there's an input device, the switch. There's an output device, the light. There is uh, memory. The switch remembers what position it's in. And there is control logic within the wires of the walls. <laughs> Input, output, memory, logic, and control. These are the elements that make up a computer. Now, the logic of this computer is fairly simple. If the switch is up, then the light is on. If the switch is down, the light is off. Up on, down, off, light on, light off. So here's a little model of that behavior uh, written as a computer program right here. And notice over here, I've actually got a little light bulb <laughs> and a, uh, a switch. And if the switch is down, then the light is off. But if the switch is up, then the light is on. So you can see that the switch and the light behave just like they should. Now, let's look at the program. Here is the program that controls this switch and this light. There's a few things you should ignore. Uh, ignore this line entirely. We'll, we'll come to that later. Ignore parentheses. Ignore dots. Ignore semicolons. Ignore the word void. That's all coming later. It's not important right now. What is important is this. If switch A is up. Why did I say switch A? Well, I named this switch A. Yeah. So if switch A is up, then the light is on. Otherwise, the light is off. That is the logic that controls this little program right here. And this is the program that is running when I do this. So. There's the logic. 
That code's not very hard to understand, is it? I mean, it reads very nicely. If the switch is up, the light is on, otherwise the light's off. But here's the thing. Everything in software is just that simple. You are never going to find a concept in software that is any more complicated than that. That's not to say that there aren't complicated problems in software. Believe me, there are. It's just that all of those complicated problems can always be broken down into statements that are as simple as if, up, then, on. Always. To give you an example of how complexities arise in such simple systems, look over here at this switch. <laughs> this switch it's not the same switch as before. That switch is over there. This switch is by a different door, by the hobby room door. But notice this switch controls the overhead light too. But this switch seems to use different control logic because look, the switch is down, but the light is on. And when we raise the switch, the light goes off. <laughs> down, on, up, off. <laughs> so here's our program again, except this time there are two switches, A and B. And switch A works as you would expect, just like it did before. And that's because the switch A rule is still here. But switch B doesn't do anything at all. And that's because there's no rule over here for switch B. So let's add the rule for switch B the way we stated it. If switch B dot is up, well, then we'll turn the light off. Remember, okay? it's the opposite. Uh, otherwise, uh, then we'll turn the light on. Now, uh, if we run this program, we see that switch B is down and the light is on. And if we raise switch B, the light goes off. So that's working exactly the way it's supposed to. Um, I guess our rule is working. Um, are we done? Well, you see, programmers have to be careful about saying that they're done because it's possible to break one rule when you add another one. And that's really what we've done here. Uh, when we added the rule for switch B, we've broken the rule for switch A, which I can show you by demonstrating that switch A doesn't do anything at all. Why is switch A not working when switch A's rule is sitting right here? And the answer to that is that the computer executes these rules in order. It first executes the rule for switch A because switch A is the first rule here, and then it executes the rule for switch B. And look at what happens in the rule for switch B. If B is up, the light will be off. If B is down, the light will be on. This completely erases the effect of switch A. Switch A, even though switch A is actually happening, this rule is getting executed. Uh, this rule here, switch B's rule, overrides it. If you could look very carefully, you would see that light flash for an instant when I turned it on, because this statement is getting executed. But switch, switch B's statement here comes along so fast that it turns the light off before you can even see it. If we were to take these two rules and uh, change their order so that switch B's rule is first and switch A's rule is second, well, notice what happens then. Switch A works. Switch B doesn't do anything. It's the rule that executes last that you get to see working. <laughs> so clearly there's something wrong with our logic. There must be something about this problem that we don't understand yet. Uh, let's go back to the switches and take a closer look. Okay, so switch A is up and the light's on. That's right. And switch B is down and the light is on. That's right. Okay, so now let's change the state of switch A. Uh, switch A goes down 
and the light's off. And that's right. But look at switch B. Switch B is down and the light is off. That's wrong. Well, well it can't be wrong because that's the way the system works. But it's not the way we thought it worked. I guess these two switches depend upon each other. It's not as simple as up, on, down, off, right? This is more complicated than that. I think we're going to have to write it down. Okay, so I've made a table of the four possible switch positions. Uh, they can both be up, they can both be down, or they can be the opposite of each other. So there's four possible states. Now, let's go out there and write down what happens to the light when we put the switch in these four positions. All right, um, so um, down, up. Down, up is on. And uh, how about up, up? Up, up is off. Uh, okay, so now up, down, that's on, and down, down, and that's off. Huh. So, um, if the two switches are the same, either both up or both down, then the light is off. But if the two switches are different, then the light is on. This little computer of ours is actually kind of smart. It can compare the state of those two switches. And if the two switches aren't the same, then it turns the light on. But if the two switches are the same, it turns the light off. And think about what this means. It means that any time anybody changes just one switch, the state of the light changes. So you never have to hunt for the right switch. You just find a switch and you don't, it doesn't matter, boom, you just change it. This is really kind of smart. So let's write this code. This is the old bad code. Let's get rid of that. Now the new code, I think it looks like this. If switch A dot is up, and um, this is how we do and right there, and uh, switch B dot is up. Then, well, that means that the light should go on. Uh, and also, if switch A dot is down, and switch B is down, then the light should be on. And if not, then the light should be off. Hmm. Uh, how do we get the light to turn off? Let's do this. Let's say light dot off. So first we'll turn the light off and then we'll turn it on again if it ought to be on. And that should be switch B there. And uh, let's see, we'll get rid of that blank line because I don't like extra blank lines. And let's see if this works. Okay, they're both down, so it's on. That turned it off. That turned it on, that turned it off, that turned it on, that works. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. So this is the logic here. This is the logic we want. Although I kind of hate turning it off and then turning it on again. And I wonder if we can do better. And, and I think we can. Let's, let's do this. Let's say, um, or. That's how you do an or right there, right? So, now we can say if switch A is up and switch B is up or switch A is down and switch B is down, then the light should be on and else uh, the light should be dot off. Let's try that one. Okay. Um, oh, that seems to work. Yes. Okay. That works just like it should. But why did it work? Um, notice that the ands seem to take precedence over the or. For example, I say switch A is up and switch B is up, or switch A is down and switch B is down. Notice the pause and the way I said or. The, the ands seem to take place before the ors. Let me put parentheses in to accentuate that a little bit. This is how we make sure that things happen first in most languages. We put parentheses in. 
And now you can see that that grouping right there and that grouping right there will both happen before that. So the ands take place before the ors, uh, in this case because of the parentheses. Now, it just so happens that in the language Java, ands take place before ors anyway. That's just a natural consequence of the language, the way the language is written. So I don't need those parentheses, uh, although it might be polite uh, to the poor reader to leave them in. Uh, rather than depending on the natural precedence of the language. So maybe I'll just leave them in that way. And uh, let's run it again, make sure I didn't break anything. Uh, yeah, that's the way it works. Okay. Is this the best we can do? Well, remember what we said. We said that if the two switches are in the same position, the light should be on. So either both down or both up. So what if we did this? Instead of this horrible logical expression there, what if we said if um, switch A dot state equals switch B dot state? Ooh, I wonder if that'll work. Oh, yeah, that works too. Look at that. That's much simpler. If the two switch states are equal, then we turn the light on. Otherwise, we turn the light off. <laughs> That's cool. Earlier, we saw some code on the screen that looked like this. If switch A is up, and switch B is up. Uh, what does that word and mean? Now, I know that seems obvious, but one of the things you learn pretty quickly about computer programming is that it's the obvious things that get you into trouble. So, what we're going to have to do is be as precise as possible. One of the most important things about programming computers is to be completely precise. And that means we're going to have to understand the definitions of words like and and or thoroughly and completely. So what does and mean? This and right there, what does that mean? So let's look at the sentence again. Notice that the AND symbol connects two clauses. Here's the first clause, switch A is up, and the second clause, switch B is up. These two clauses are special because they can only have two results, true or false. A clause that can only have those two results, true or false, is called a Boolean clause. And the true or the false value that it can have is called a Boolean value. It's called Boolean after a man named George Boole who worked out an entire mathematics of true and false. Uh, we're going to get to that later. Anyway, here we've got our AND symbol connecting two Boolean values. Now, what does AND mean? Well, here is a truth table that describes what AND means, and notice that this truth table has one output, A and B. It has two inputs, A and B. These two inputs are called Boolean variables. A and B are Boolean variables because they can only have two values, true or false. The operation A and B is a Boolean operation because it can have only two results, true or false. You see there's false and just true. The value of the AND operation is true only if both A and B are true. Every other combination of A and B results in a false value for A and B. So in order to be true, A and B have to be true. Let's see that in action. Let's replace this expression here with switch A dot is up and switch 
B dot is up. And now let's run this. And um, we should notice that the light will come on only if both A and B are up. This matches our truth table perfectly. What you have just learned is very important. So hold it in your mind. Don't let it slip away. A big part of computer programming is the understanding and manipulation of Boolean variables. Variables that have only two values, true and false. So, remember all of this. In fact, you might want to write it down. We also saw a statement that looked like this. If switch A is up and switch B is up, or switch A is down and switch B is down, what is the meaning of the word or in that statement? And remember, we have to be completely precise. The word or seems to separate two clauses in parentheses, and both of those clauses are and clauses. And that means, of course, that they are Boolean clauses. Therefore, the word or is connecting two Boolean values. Here's the truth table for A or B. This is the OR operation here. And notice that the value of A or B is false only if both A and B are false. Uh, otherwise, if either A or B or both are true, then the value of A or B is true. So the value of A or B is true if A or B or both are true. Let's see this in action as well. I'll just change this AND here to an OR, and we'll run this program. And now, if either switch is up, the light will be on. And if both switches are up, the light will be on. Once again, this matches our truth table for OR perfectly. These two truth tables are important for you to memorize because as a programmer, you're going to encounter the logical operations of AND and OR over and over and over again. And now let me show you one more very important logical operation. The logical operation called NOT. This is the symbol for NOT, an exclamation mark in our language. Uh, sometimes that mark is pronounced BANG. Here is the truth table for the NOT operation. The NOT operation has a single input, A, and a single output, NOT A. If A is true, then NOT A is false. If A is false, then not A is true. We sometimes refer to this as inversion. Once again, let's see that in action. We're going to wire up our little program here so that it uses the inversion of switch A is up. And we do that inversion with this exclamation mark. Uh, that's pronounced not. So if not switch A is up, and if we run this program, we will see that if switch A is down, the light is on. If switch A is up, the light is off. Right? So that's the inversion of switch A. And notice switch B does nothing because we have nothing wired up for switch B. And, or, and not. These are the three fundamental Boolean operations. Everything a computer does is in fact a combination of these three operations. All the math a computer can do, all the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are just combinations of ands, ors, and nots. You may find that hard to believe, but I'll prove it to you a little bit later. But for now, let's see another little bit of Boolean magic. Now look here at this truth table for the AND operation. You'll recognize it as AND because the only true output is the one with two true inputs. Every other output is false. That's the AND operation. So now we're going to invert 
every true and false in this table. We will invert the two inputs, we will invert the output. Watch as I do this, the new value will be in red. This will be a true, this will be a true, that will be a true. This will be a false, this will be a true, that will be a true. This will be a true, that will be a false, this will be a true. This will be a false, this will be a false, this will be a false. And now look what we have. Compare this table to that table. That's the truth table for or. And notice, true and true is true. False and true is true. True and false is true. False and false is false. That is the truth table for or. By inverting the inputs and the output, we change an AND into an OR. Okay, now let's see this in action. I'm going to start with that NOT again, and then I'm going to take everything and put it in parentheses. So I'm going to do a bunch of stuff in parentheses here, and then I'm going to invert it. And what I'm going to put in parentheses is not switch a dot is up and not switch b dot is up. And I'm missing a couple of parentheses there and there and uh, let's see, I need one more here. Good. Now, let's see if we can read this properly. Got lots of parentheses in here, but we've got not switch A is up and not switch B is up, and then we're going to invert that. So it's the not of the not switch A is up and not switch B is up. I know, a lot of nots. But let's, um, let's run it. And, um, oh my, uh, it goes on if B is up, it goes on if A is up, and it goes on if both is up. That's the OR operation, isn't it? If you invert the inputs of an AND and then invert the output of that AND, you get an OR. A OR B. And now let's do the same thing to the truth table for OR. We're going to invert all of the inputs and the output. So that's going to be a true and a true and a true. And this is going to be a false and a true and a false. And this is going to be a true and a false and a false. And this is going to be a false and a false and a false. And, a false. and what do we wind up with? We wind up with the truth table for AND. <laughs> if you invert the inputs and the output of OR, you get AND. And let's see that in action too. I'll just change this AND to an OR. Everything else remains the same. And now when we run this, we should see that um, the light does not go on unless both A and B are on. If you invert the inputs of an OR and then you invert the output, you get an AND. The fact that you can change AND into OR by inverting the inputs and the output, and the fact that you can change OR into AND by inverting the inputs and the output, are facts that you are going to have to commit to memory. Because every programmer needs to know how to use these facts intuitively. These facts are known as De Morgan's Law, after Augustus De Morgan, who discovered them in the 1800s. And all of this logic, these truth tables and laws, are part of a mathematical discipline known as Boolean Algebra. This is a topic we'll be returning to in another episode because mastery of this skill is important for all computer programmers.
But enough of this mathematical mumbo jumbo, because our light switch has a new wrinkle. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> All right. So, look at over here. <laughs> There's another light switch on that wall, right by the stairs. And if I flip it, it turns the overhead lights off. If I flip it again, it turns the overhead lights on. <laughs> There's not two switches that control this light. There's three switches that control this light. What is the logic for three switches controlling the light? So let's write down that truth table. Whoa, that's quite a table. How are we going to write the code for this table? Well, we could brute force our way through it like this. I mean, here are the, uh, the four expressions for the, the light on part of the truth table. So if switch A is down and switch B is down and switch C is up, then the light will be on. Or if switch A is down, switch B is up and switch C is down, the light will be on, or switch A is up, switch B is down, switch C is down, the light will be on, or switch A is up and switch B is up and switch C is up. All of those will turn the light on, otherwise the light goes off. And, um, I mean, this works. I mean, every time you change a switch, right, it changes the light. And that's the right behavior. No matter what switch you go to, it changes the state of the light whenever you toggle that switch. So that is the right behavior, but boy, is that ugly code, huh? I mean, you wouldn't want to have to read that for the rest of your life, would you? There must be something we can do to make it better. And one thing you can do to make code better is to use some variables and some names. Here, here let me show you. So this really cleans things up a lot. Just these three Boolean variables here, A, B, and C, which are set to the state of the switch's uh, up state, uh, then you just use these uh, logical expressions here and it works just fine. Uh, this is the inversion of A, so that would be if switch A is down and switch B is down and C is up, or switch A is down, B is up and C is down, or switch A is up, B is down, C is down, or A is up, B is up, C is up. And this works just like before. Every time you toggle a switch, it changes the state of the light. So that's working perfectly. And it's a lot prettier than before. I mean, never underestimate the power of some pleasant names. But I bet we can do better still. Let's look at this truth table again because there's some obvious groupings that we might be able to take advantage of. For example, notice that the first four rows have A as being false and the second four rows have A as being true. I bet you we can use some parentheses to group that together. Yes, I think we can capture that grouping. Do you see how the not A and is present there and the not a and is present there and they're separated by an or operation here let's um let's bring these two up to the same line that's better now i think what we can do is we can use something called the distributive law of and over or uh, you don't need to know that for the moment uh, later on you will but uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put parentheses around this and I'm going to get rid of the a and 
here, the not a and there. And so this will be not a and, not b and c, or b and not c. And if I did this correctly, then it should behave as it did before, uh, which it does. It's behaving just fine. And I should be able to repeat this again uh, here on the second line by bringing those up to the same line. Then I'll put a parenthesis there and another one here and just remove that a and there. And if I did that correctly, it should still work out fine. And it looks like it does. Yes, that's behaving properly. So, I mean, that's a little better. Maybe not a lot better, but it does expose something to the trained eye. Do you see this expression right here? Not B and C or B and not C. That happens to be an operation that we call an exclusive or. If you know it, if you are trained in this, then you would recognize that as an exclusive or. Here is the truth table for exclusive or. Notice that it looks just like an OR operation except for the final row. In the final row, if both A and B are true, then the result of exclusive OR is false. And what that means is, is that exclusive OR will be true only if A and B are different. But if A and B are the same, then exclusive OR is false. This is another one of those ones you're going to want to commit to memory. Every programmer has to be able to use exclusive or intuitively. Now it just so happens that I've written an exclusive or function elsewhere and it goes by the name XOR. So I'm going to replace this with a call to my XOR function, my XOR function, like so. That does the same thing as that previous expression, except it calls my XOR function. And now, if I run this, I believe it will work as it did before. Oh, yes, it works just like it did before. Uh, that's much better, isn't it? <laughs> except that we still have this ugly expression down here. This whole if statement is asymmetrical and I, I don't like things that are asymmetrical. They bother me. Hmm. So here's that expression we saw in our code. Not B and not C or B and C. And if we create the truth table for that entire expression using B and C as our inputs, we get true, false, false, true. Now, if you remember what XOR looks like, XOR is the opposite of that, false, true, true, false. So our expression here is the inverse of exclusive OR. It's not B X or C, and that actually is an operation that we call exclusive NOR or XNOR. <laughs> so this gives us the ability to clean things up a little bit. So our ugly expression down here is the opposite of an XOR. It's an XNOR, which means we should just be able to say this. There, that's the not of the XOR of B and C. Uh, let's see if that works. Oh, heavens. Um, yeah, it looks like it works just fine, doesn't it? Every time you touch a switch, it inverts. That's very nice, good. Um, okay, well, gosh, um, you should see something interesting here. Not A and something, or A and not something. You know what that is, don't you? That's our XOR function. So I think we can do this. I wonder if that'll work. It certainly does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a lot better, isn't it? 
The three switches? That is just the exclusive OR of switch A with the exclusive OR of switch B and C. <laughs> By now, I hope I've convinced you that understanding those truth tables is both important and powerful. I mean, we took some pretty ugly code, and by using those truth tables, we reduced it down to something both simple and elegant. If you didn't follow what we did, or you don't think you understand it entirely, go back and review it, because we've got a lot more to do. Believe it or not, there's another switch. Come on, follow me. <laughs> it's way over here. Look at this. Way the heck over here, right by the guest room door, there is another switch that controls the overhead light. <laughs> and look, I can go to the one by the hobby room door and if I turn the light off from this switch, well then I can turn the light on from the switch by my office door, and then I can go over here to the one by the stairs, and I can turn the lights off with that one. This is cool, isn't it? So here's the truth table for the four switches. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there are 16 rows here because there are 16 possible combinations of four switches. And if you analyze this truth table carefully, you will find that if you change the state of just one switch, you will invert the state of the light. Work through it if you'd like to. Prove that to yourself. Any single change from a true to a false will invert the state of the light. Now, can you imagine writing this in code with all the ands and the ors and the nots? Here, let me show you what that would look like. Yeah, so this is pretty awful, isn't it? I mean, look at that. <laughs> look, um, it works. Let me show you. I can run it. And uh, every time you touch a switch, it inverts the uh, light bulb every single time and by the way now testing it is starting to get a little bit difficult because are you sure you're hitting all the switch combinations but yes it does work um but look no programmer worth their salt would leave code looking like this it's awful there has to be a better solution a and of course there is so look, let's put that original uh, three switch solution back in. That was just the XOR of A with the XOR of B and C. There we go. And uh, that should work with A, B, and C, but D doesn't do anything. Now, there's a little pattern here, isn't there? Could it really be as simple as that? Could it? Could that be the solution? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> that looks like the solution. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, notice... Um, the nice little pattern there. That's uh, that's really nice, isn't it? <laughs> Do you see the value of learning these truth tables and logical operations intimately? I mean, without them, we could have built that code out of long chains of ifs and ands and ors and nots. But by applying those truth tables and understanding the logic, we were able to reduce that down to a simple set of elegant statements, a very manageable size bit of code. And believe me, when you're maintaining tens of thousands of lines of code, you'll be grateful for any little help you can get. I promise there are no more switches. <laughs> But I do have a question. Does that solution implemented by the switches out there address the actual need? 
the need was to be able to control the light from any of the light switches. So, for example, I might be walking down these stairs into a dark room and need to turn the lights on. Or, perhaps I'm walking into my office and I need to turn the light off. Or maybe I'm walking out of the guest room into a dark room and I need to turn it on. There are four switches in this room, and from any one of those switches, we need to be able to control the lights in this room. And that's just what we have, isn't it? That's what this truth table proves. If anybody changes the state of one switch, the state of the light will change. And that's just what this simple and elegant code achieves. But is this what we really need? For example, imagine there are two people entering this room at the same time. They can't see each other. They both want to turn the light on, and they both flip their respective switches at the same time. What happens? Nothing. Nothing changes. The lights don't go on because two switches have changed. This is certainly not what we want. The light should have turned on. And notice that our program has the same behavior. If, if I throw two switches at once, um, the light doesn't change state. It might flicker a little bit if the two switches aren't thrown at exactly the same time. But uh, notice that when the two switches are thrown, the state of the light remains the same. Now, this is not what we want. Uh, when two people change the switches at the same time, we'd like the state of the light to change. This is very typical of the kinds of problems that programmers face and the kinds of mistakes that programmers make. When considering the behavior of a program, it is easy to forget that time is often a factor. In our case, forgetting about time meant forgetting that two events could occur simultaneously. How should we fix this? The first problem is to detect when the light should change. Now the light should change when any change occurs to any number of the switches. How are we going to detect that change? When something changes, it means its current state is different from some previous state. So, for example, here's this switch. First it was in this state, now it's in that state. Notice it's all about time. So, to detect a change, we're going to have to be able to compare the past to the present. We're going to have to know what the state of the switches was and compare that to the state of the switches now. And to do that, we're going to have to use the computer's memory to save the past state of the switches. We could do that like this. Uh, look at this if statement here. If, if the position of A is not equal to the last position of A, or the position of B is not equal to the last position of B, or C not equal to the last C, or D not equal to the last C. In other words, if any of the switches have changed, or even if several of the switches have changed, then we change the state of the light. We set the, the light state equal to not the light state. Uh, we reverse the state of the light. And this works. I mean, as you can see here, I can, I can click on the lights and it still behaves normally. Um, but I can also hit multiple switches at the same time and notice that the light changes properly. Uh, that's the behavior we're after. But this is ugly. This code here is ugly. It's got four different variables in it. It's checking four different things. And what we'd really like here is something like this. Um, current switch state uh, not equal to last switch state. That's what we'd like to see uh, in the code itself. That's what the code meant before. But this is what we'd like to see in our code. And that means that we need a way to represent the state of all four switches in a single value that can be given a single name. Well, that's actually not very hard to do. Let's imagine that the four switches 
represent the digits within a four digit number. And if the switch is up, we set that digit to a one, we set the corresponding digit to a one. If the switch is down, we set the corresponding digit to a zero. So for example, if switch A were down, well then we'd make that digit a zero. And if switch B were up, well then we'd make that digit a one. But if switch C were down, well then that digit would be a zero. And if switch D were up, well then that digit would be a one, and that would give us the number 101. But if, let's say, A were up, well then we'd want that to be a one, and B, let's say that's up, so that's also a one, and C is down, that's a zero, and let's have D go down, okay. So now we've got the number 1,100. That gives us a way to represent every, every combination of the switches as a number. You may be wondering why I would use a trick like this. Well, the answer to that is that I want to find a simple way to represent the state of those four switches. This is actually something that computer programmers do a lot of. We spend a lot of time hunting for simplifying representations of complicated systems. So I can construct my simple representation with this uh, set of if statements right here. I, I begin by setting the current switch state to zero and then if A is up uh, then I add a thousand to the current switch state. So this will change the current switch state by a thousand. Uh, if B is up, then I add a hundred to the current switch state. If C is up, then I add 10 to the current switch state. And if D is up, I add one to the current switch state. And then I print the current switch state here. And I'll show you how this works. It's fairly straightforward. Um, notice we begin with all the switches down and, and down here at the bottom, we see a zero. That's because the current switch state is zero. Why is it zero? Well, we set it to zero here, and then since all the switches are down, we never added anything. But if I were to uh, make switch A up, uh, then notice that down here, again, the current switch state is now equal to a thousand. Um, that's because if A is up, then current switch state gets uh, an extra thousand added to it. If I raise B over here, you'll notice that now the, um, the current switch state is 1100 because both A and B are up. A uh, thousand gets added to current switch state and a hundred gets added to current switch state. And when we print current switch state, we see that 1100. And I can continue that ad infinitum. I raise all of the switches and down here you see I've got a 1111, which is good, 1111. Or um, I think uh, uh, Bilbo Baggins called that 1111. Anyway, um, if I turn any of the switches off, you'll see that the appropriate digit goes back to zero. So I can easily make 1001 by having the, uh, the switch A and D up, but B and C down, and so on. And this is just what we expect. Now we've got a single value, current switch state, that represents the position of all the switches. So now all we have to do is remember that representation, save it somewhere. And then the next time we compute it, we can compare the current representation to the old one. And if they're different, well then we know that the switches have changed and we can change the state of the light. So that's pretty easy. Uh, here, let me get rid of that print statement because we don't need that anymore. This if statement right here does exactly what we want. Uh, if the current switch state is not equal to the last switch state, that means that somebody changed something, and they may have changed more than one switch, but if they did, if something changed, then we are going to invert the state of the light. We are going to say that the light dot state, the state of the light, 
is equal to the inverse, that's what that bang means, remember, the inverse of the current state of the light. And that should change the state of the light. And then, uh, look here, we remember uh, the current state of the switch uh, in the last state of the switch. Last switch state equals current switch state. That just takes this value here, the current switch state, and moves it into the last switch state so that the next time we come through here, we will remember what the last switch state was. Now, uh, now look at this code again. You don't need to understand everything about it. There's some mysteries here that I'm sure you're wondering about. All I care about right now is that you grasp the essence of what's going on. This is where we gather up the state of the switches into independent variables, A, B, C, and D. And this is where we compute the representation of the switches into a single variable, the current switch state. And then we compare that the current switch state is not equal to the last switch state. And if it is not, then we invert the state of the light and then we remember the last switch date. We move the current switch date into the last switch date. Now, uh, does this work? Uh, well, here I can run it, and um, you'll see that it, it works just like our XOR version did. If anybody ever touches a switch, then it inverts the state of the light. But it's better than that, because if someone were to touch two switches, then notice that the state of the light inverts even though two switches are changing. Our XOR version would not have done this. So this is better. Although, you may notice that it's just a little tricky uh, getting both of those switches to change at the same time. Uh, sometimes they don't exactly change at precisely the same time. <laughs> but when they do, when they change at exactly the same time, then the state of the light inverts. Hmm. It was pretty tricky to flip those switches at the same time, wasn't it? And the reason behind that is that the computer is very, very fast. It sees two events that are a thousandth of a second apart as two very separate events. In fact, a computer might look at two events that are a billionth of a second apart and think of them as separate. Whereas we humans we think of two events that occur within a second of each other as being simultaneous, especially if those events are flipping a light switch. Think about what this means. What we're trying to solve here is a human problem, not a machine problem. So when two humans enter this room and they flip their switches at the same time, we want the lights to change. At the same time is a human concept not a machine concept. So let's see how our program behaves here. I'm going to start it running. The light is currently off. Now, I'm going to um, let me just try it here. I mean, it's working. I'm going to change two lights at the same time, but not quite at the same time. Now, watch carefully what happens. Oh. Did you notice that the light flickered, but it remains off now. Uh, the two people tried to change the light and they flipped the switches at almost the same time and the end result is, is the light didn't change state. It flickered but it remained off. Uh, this, is, this is not how we want this program to behave. Uh, how are we going to fix this? This is a timing problem, isn't it? It all comes down to timing. We're going to have to measure the time between two events. And if that time is too short, we want to reject the second event. If someone turns a light on and then someone else very quickly throws another switch, we don't want that switch turning the light off. So any event that comes within, oh, say, a half a second of another event, we want to reject. So here's a timing diagram that shows this situation. This is switch A. It's down. Switch B, down, light is off. That's how time begins. Now, um, a half a second later, switch A goes up. And that means that we should turn the light on. So the light goes on. Then nothing happens for a full second. 
right? This time in here is a full second. And then B goes up. Well, that's long enough. One second is long enough. So we will accept that event and change the state of the light. The light will now go off. But now, within the next half second, there's another event. Switch A goes down. And that's too short a time. Half a second is too short. So we decide to reject that event and not change the state of the light. Okay, so this is going to take just a little bit of extra code. Uh, the first code we'll look at is this here. This millis function, that returns the number of milliseconds since the program was started. A millisecond is a thousandth of a second. So current time will be set to the number of milliseconds since the program started. If you don't know what this means, that little int there, that just means that current time is an integer. So now that I have the current time, I'm going to check to see if the state of the switch has changed. And if it did, then I'm going to check to see if it's been more than a half a second since the last time the state of the light changed. Now, how do I know that? Well, I take the current time and I subtract from it the time that the light last changed. And again, this is in milliseconds. So if I subtract those two and the result is greater than 500 milliseconds, then I know that it's been more than a half a second since the state of the light changed. So if it has been more than half a second, then I change the state of the light. Otherwise I don't, I leave the state of the light alone. But if it's been more than half a second, then I change the state of the light, and then I remember the last time that I changed the state of the light. I set last change time to current time. Now you might be wondering what happens the first time through. What's the value of last change time the first time through? Well, a little bit of secret code up here. I uh, set last change time equal to millis, so that that would make sense. Now, this code works. If I hit switch A, you see that it changes the state of the light. If I hit switch B, uh, it changes it again. If I hit them in very rapid succession, you notice that it does change the state of the light, which is correct. And if I hit them in slower succession, then it works properly. The light, the state of the light changes. The state of the light will not change, however, if I hit them within a half a second. Bang, bang. Notice, no change. Bang, bang. No change. Bang, bang. So imagine that two people have entered the room in different parts of the room. They can't see each other. The light is off. They both want the light to be on. They both reach for the light switch. And within a half a second, bang, bang, and the light is on. Even though two people switched the switch at slightly different times, the light remains on. That's the correct behavior for this program. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. What would happen if someone turned the lights on and then very quickly realized that they'd rather have the lights off and turned them off within a half a second? The lights wouldn't go off, would they? Let's see this in operation. Uh, imagine that I'm a 12-year-old and I'm just walking into the room and I turn the lights on and then I forget something and I, I realize I have to go back and so I turn the lights off. Uh, real fast. And here's what happens. The lights stay on. Now, 12-year-old in me says, wait a minute, that's not how that was supposed to work. So I hit the switch again, and of course the light goes off. And, and that's odd, isn't it? <laughs> and so to play with it, I hit the switch three times. And the second two times I flipped it didn't do anything. And, and so I just start flipping madly, and, and I notice that the light does not behave the way the switch is behaving. The light will only change once every half second. Mom, the lights down here just don't work right.
This violates a principle called the principle of least surprise. When designing software for humans to use, you don't want the humans to find the behavior of that software surprising in any way. And not turning off a light when you flip a switch could be somewhat surprising. How should we solve this problem? Well, actually, I think I'll let you work that out. And at the end of the episode, I'll show you how to get all set up so that you can run these programs on your local computer. I'll give you a little hint, though. It's all about the timing, and it's all about which switch you believe. If the same switch changes within a half a second, you should believe it. It's only if a different switch changes within a half a second that you should ignore it. By now, you should have gotten the idea that designing software for humans to use is tricky business. Even a system as absurdly simple as light switches contains hidden complexities that can make the code get fairly complicated. This is one of the reasons that computer programming is so much fun. Getting a program right is both challenging and very rewarding. And getting software right involves having a good grasp of the basics. So, before we end this episode, let's dive into one of those basics. Look at the way we calculated the representation of the switches, right? We used this scheme where each switch was a digit from one to a thousand. And that means that the state of the switches can go from zero all the way up to 1,111, right? 11 to 11. Now, does that seem wasteful to you? I mean, there's only 16 ways those switches can be positioned. Why would we use a variable that can go all the way up above 1,000? Does that seem overkill, wasteful? To put this in some kind of perspective, look at this diagram here. I show 10 cubes, and each of those cubes looks like this, with a thousand possible little cubies in it. There's 10,000 possible little cubies. Each one of them represents one of the numbers in our four-digit number. That means we're only using 16 out of 10,000 possible numbers. That's 0.16%. Is that waste? The fact that we use 10 digits is why we call our system decimal. Des is the Latin word for 10. Decimal literally means based on 10. Why 10? Well, probably because we have 10 fingers. And actually, the word digit is Latin for finger. In the decimal system, we write digits next to each other in order to represent larger and larger numbers. And as we move to the left, we have to multiply the value of the corresponding digit by 10. So this is not a 4, that is a 40. Now to go to the left again, we have to multiply by 10 again. So this is not an 8, this is an 800. And that is not a 3, it is a 3,000. Why do we keep multiplying by 10? because we have 10 digits. We call this base 10. We can see this in the code by making a few changes. Uh, first change I made was to create this variable named base and set it equal to 10. And then over here, I replaced the 1000 that used to be here when switch A was up with base times base times base, or base cubed, that's 1000. And I replaced the 100 with base times base, or base squared. That's if switch B is up. And if switch C is up, then I replaced the 10 with base, or 10 to the first. Then if switch D is up, I didn't change anything. It's still uh, adding a 1 because base to the 0 power is 1. This is base to the third power, this is base to the second power, this is base to the first power, this is base to the zero power. 
Now, I'm going to print the current state. When I run this program, you will see, oh yeah, that's a zero. See down here, right? That's a zero, all the switches are down. And if I set switch A, sure enough, that's a thousand. And then if I set switch B, well, yes, that's going to be 1100. And if I set switch C, that's going to be 1110. And if I set switch D, 1111. <laughs> but we've only got two digits, zero and one, right? <laughs> so doesn't that mean that we could change the base of our representation to two? I mean, think about that for a minute. As we move to the left, rather than multiplying by 10, we could just multiply by 2, right? Well, uh, let's see. Um, let's just change our base from 10 to 2 and run the program. And let's see what happens when we run this program. Um, well, it seems to be working properly, doesn't it? Um, Let's try multiple switches. Yes, that seems to work. And let's see if our delay works. Yep, our delay seems to work. Everything's working fine, even with a base of two. And look down here at the, um, the printed value of the current state. If I set switch A, well, it goes to eight. And if I set switch B, well, it goes to 12. <laughs> and switch C makes it a 14. And switch D makes it a 15. And if all the switches are down, that makes it a zero. Our state goes from zero to 15. That is exactly the 16 states that our switches can be in. No waste. All the numbers are used. Cool. <laughs> When the base is 2, we say that the system is binary, which is Latin for based on 2. Now the switch representation is binary, and it works just fine. Why binary? Because switches only have two positions, so we only need two digits to represent them. But remember, at the beginning of this episode, I told you that the light switches in my basement were a kind of computer. They had input, they had output, they had memory, control, and logic. They are a computer, but they're a computer made out of switches. And as we'll learn in some upcoming episodes, all computers are built out of switches. Special kinds of switches, to be sure, but still switches. Switches that have only two positions, on and off. And so computers use binary because the switches inside those computers have only two positions, on or off, which corresponds to just two digits, zero or one. You may find this startling. You may not believe it. You look at your calculator, for example, and you see 10 digits. You look at your laptop and you see numbers on the screen that have 10 digits. You look at the keyboard, 10 digits. You look at your iPad, 10 digits. But I promise you, <laughs> deep down inside where it counts, all that math, all the logic, all the processing is being done with numbers that have only two digits, zero and one. It's all done in binary. And so in upcoming episodes, we're going to learn all about binary math and binary logic and Boolean algebra and the whole system of concepts that allows us to describe numbers and ideas in terms of two digits, one and zero. But not today. Today we've done enough. So what have we learned? Well, first we learned that computers are everywhere and software drives them all. And then we learned that programmers are in demand and will likely stay in demand for many decades to come. And finally, we learned that writing code is a great way to earn a really good living. Next, we learned that computers had input, output, memory, control, and logic. 
and I showed you that the light switch right outside my office door was in fact a little computer. And then we discovered a second light switch and that made things a little more complicated. So I showed you some Boolean logic and some truth tables. I showed you the tables for and and or and not. And I impressed upon you the importance of learning those tables and those concepts. Then we found the third switch. And when we wrote down the truth table for the third switch, it was pretty complicated. But we were able to simplify it by using a new logical operation that we called exclusive or that when we applied it twice, simplified it a lot. Then we added the fourth switch. And we found that the pattern that we had established for three switches was easily expandable to four switches. That is the power of understanding the truth tables and the logic. Then we realized that our solution worked fine if one person operated the light switches. But if two people tried to operate the light switches at the same time, then it failed. This is a very common problem in software, and we're going to come back to it in future episodes. But it's also a somewhat advanced concept, so it's going to take us a little while to get back to it. We also realized that what humans think of as simultaneous is probably not simultaneous to a computer because the computer is so fast. We learned that when we're solving human problems, we have to consider things like time from a human point of view. And we learned that that was full of interesting little complications. We learned that even simple systems like these light switches require disciplined thought because they're full of complicated little intricacies. Finally, we scratched the surface of the decimal and binary number systems. And I told you that computers use binary inside because computers are made of switches. And switches have only two states, on or off. So they compute with numbers that have only two digits, one or zero. Okay, so now I imagine you'd like to play with this computer program that we've been writing to control the light switches. <laughs> so. Here are the steps that you can follow to get it working on your computer. Now, if you don't understand these steps, you might need to get some help from someone who knows a bit about your computer system. First, we're using a free tool. The name of that tool is Processing. And you can get Processing at uh, processing.org. If you go to that website, this should pop up. And uh, there's lots of information on this uh, site that will tell you how to use processing. But we want to go here, downloading processing. All right, so we're going to click on that download processing button. And that brings you here to a window which allows you to make a donation if you'd like to. You don't have to. You can click on no donation if you want. Although later you might want to come back and make a donation because these guys have done a lot of very good work. Anyway, you click on the download button and that takes you to a window which allows you to select the system that you're running. I'm running Mac OS, uh, but you might be running Windows or Linux. You get to choose. I will download from Mac OS. You download from something else. That will cause the download to begin. You can see it down here. Uh, it is a hundred and some megabytes, so it can take a while. Now that the download is done, you can find the downloaded file. There's a number of ways to do this. Uh, I've just found it by selecting uh, Show in Finder. You may have a different way. Here it is here. This is the file, uh, processing dot blah, blah, blah. It is a zip file. Uh, and so let's see if I can blow that up a little bit so you can see it. Processing 3.02, Mac OS X, uh, and I've downloaded a number of times. Anyway, I'm going to um, uh, unzip it by double clicking it. And you'll notice that that will unzip it for me and create yet another file called processing.app. 
This is the processing application. And what we want to do with that is move it to uh, the applications folder. Uh, wherever you keep your applications, that's where you ought to move it. And let it copy it in there. And now if we go to the applications folder or wherever you keep your applications uh, and we look for something named processing or processing, however you say it, you should be able to double click it. And if you double click it, it should come up and open. Uh, you may have to answer a few security questions here and there, but okay, here is processing. That's what it looks like when it comes up. All right. Now, before we do anything, we're going to want to go get the source code that uh, we were playing with in the episode. So let's go to the Clean Coders application. You're probably there already because you're watching this, right? So you're probably there. Look on the page for this uh, episode and you will see a uh, Get Extras. So go ahead and click that. And you will notice that uh, it starts to download something. And that what it's downloading is a zip file with all of the extras. <laughs> and it, you'll find that zip file uh, somewhere the same way you found it uh, before. And um, it should look something like this. P101-E1-extras.zip. Now, what I'd like you to do is unpack that by double-clicking it or however you unpack it. And that should leave you with a folder named P101-E1-Extras. And inside that folder, you should find LightSwitches.zip, which I want you to unpack <laughs> again. Yes. And that should leave you with a folder named LightSwitches. Now, let's go back to the processing application. Here's our processing application. We'll dismiss this window because we don't really care about this window at all. And uh, up at the top, you can't see it. It's on my screen, you can't see it. It's in the menu bar. Um, there is a, a menu called File. And what I'd like you to do is select the Open item. And uh, from the Open item, I want you to go find that uh, light switches folder that you had before that you just unpacked here it is let's see um in p101 extras light switches good go into that folder and select light switches dot pde it doesn't matter which of these pdes actually any of them but select light switches pde good and there it is there's the code Okay, now, um, this is code that you haven't seen yet, actually. The, codes, the code that you've seen looks like um, that. <laughs> That's just part of the light switches application. You don't have to understand all of it. Just this part here is all you really need to understand. Um, you'll see that there's lots of extra stuff here. But before we get into that, there's one more step you need to follow. Up at the top, where you can't see it on my screen, is a tools menu. And if you go to that tools menu, you will see a menu item called add tool. You can see that. Click that. And click on the libraries tab. Scroll down until you find the sound library. Let's see. Sound. There it is. Click it. It should select it and now click the install button and it'll download the sound library and install it into processing. Uh, and that's the library that makes the nice little clicking sounds that uh, your switches will make. Good. Now you can dismiss this window here and run the program and the program should run and it should work. <laughs> I hope you get to this point. Because this is great, isn't it? I mean, the program's working and everything. Um, if you got stuck along the way, you might need to get some help from somebody who knows a little bit about uh, the computer system you're using. Uh, before I sign off here, let me show you one other thing. Notice how when we run it, there are um, four switches that show up. 
Remember also during the episode, I sometimes had three switches or two switches or one switch? Well, here are the files here that have the different number of switches. So there's the four switch scenario. That's the one that has all this fancy code with all the timing that we did with the millis and the representation of the state and so on. And there's the three switch scenario, which we really didn't do very much with, just kind of the XOR problem, remember that? And there's the two switch scenario, and the two switch scenario we really left, uh, well, you may remember that, right? <laughs> just comparing the states of the switches directly. And there's even the one switch scenario, and boy, oh boy, that one was really simple, wasn't it? If the switch is up, the light's on, otherwise it's off. You can change which scenario we're running by going to the light switches tab. See that up here? And the light switches tab, um, you just change that right there to a oh, two switch scenario and hit the run button. And now it'll come up with two switches. Or you can change it to three switch scenario and hit the run button. And it'll come up with the three switch scenario. Uh, so you can change it to whatever you'd like. Four switch is where we left it. Right. Doop, doop, doop. And it'll work just as before. So I hope you get all that working and enjoy it. And remember to solve that last problem that we talked about. All right. If someone changes the same switch several times, we probably want it to change the state of the light every time they change that switch. So <laughs> good luck, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. So that's it. That's the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I hope the episode made you want to learn more. Because believe me, there is a lot more to learn. Every one of these episodes coming up, we're going to learn a little bit more Java. As each episode goes by, your capabilities in Java will increase. But every episode is also going to focus on some aspect of computer science, computer internals, Boolean algebra, logic, binary mathematics, and so on. We're going to learn all of the materials you need to know to be a well-rounded programmer. And we're going to begin with the next episode. You're not going to want to miss episode two of Programming 101, Logic. <laughs>